we're linking water baptism and the Lord's Supper under law. Uh, and I think it's an important thing to do so because we tend to read what Paul says about it back into law. Uh, our water friends, those who believe in a, a water baptism, read what's uh, under law into the dispensation of grace. But uh, there are those who think that these two things have never been connected. Uh, and uh, as uh, you have seen in the first hour, uh, there is going to be a connection uh, coming in the, the scriptures. Um, it doesn't have anything whatsoever to do with us, but it pertained to them. They had to be baptized with kingdom baptism to be saved. Uh, and they had to be added to the kingdom church. But uh, since we're not bringing back the king and bringing in the kingdom, since we're not Israel, we have nothing whatsoever to do with the, with the coming earthly kingdom. These things don't mean anything to us, but we need to understand them. Uh, because we can just as well get corrupt about our thinking on water baptism or the Lord's Supper if we tend to read it back into these pages when they do not pertain. Now what we're talking about is that water baptism was induction into the kingdom national priesthood of Israel. And so in verse number 20 it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, this is Zechariah 8, It shall come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities. Now note that. These are now Gentiles either under law or under the millennial kingdom. These are not Gentiles under grace. We do not go today to be saved to Israel's national priesthood. Now, do you get how, how important that is to understand? It was Israel's national priesthood with its kingdom baptism and kingdom church that was given the great commission to go into all the world, which included Gentiles, and be saved. But how are they saved? baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, uh, that's how they were saved. They were saved according to God's kingdom program. Today, people who require baptism for salvation are not saved. They're going straight to hell if they believe that message. That is not the message for us today. Our message today is apart from water baptism. Now, there are those who say, well, you're saved, but you do it as a testimony. To, they're just as heretical. They might be uh, uh, they might be saved by by grace, but as a testimony afterwards, show me that in the scriptures. Find it someplace. With, well, you say where well, you've been reading about water baptism here. Yes, but to whom does this message pertain? Jews, Jews, Israel. It's Jesus, the King of the Jews. It's John the Baptist, the the prophet of the Jews. It's the twelve apostles, the apostles of the Jews. This is their message. For their kingdom. Yes, Gentiles were to be saved, but they were to be saved how the Jews were to be saved under that dispensation. Uh, to repent, be baptized, be linked to the Abrahamic covenant, believe in Christ, and, um, and so forth. But today it's far different simply because it's a different time in history. You must keep these things separate. So, the, the Great Commission is an outworking of the Abrahamic Covenant. In thee shall all member, or all of, uh, nations of the earth be blessed by you and your seed uh, and um, uh, to go into the coming kingdom. So it says in verse 21, And the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I'll go also. Now where are they going to go? Jerusalem, of course. Many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Who's going to lead them there? The saved Jews. Unsaved Jews don't get in the kingdom and uh, they do not stay there uh, very long. There's just a thousand years and then uh, God uh, cleans house again in Israel. But in those days it shall come to pass that ten men, Gentile men, shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. This is their national global priesthood. And in order to become part of the national global priesthood, you had to have kingdom baptism. 
That's what John was doing. That's what Jesus was doing. That's what the Twelve were doing. That's what the Grace Com Commission is all about. Because of the Jews in the diaspora were in all nations of the earth. They had to go get them. It was to the Jew first. Uh, because uh, they needed to be uh, added to the kingdom church. We will go with you for we have heard that God is with you. Okay, so all the way back at the beginning of law, its preamble had a ratification. If you will, I will, says God. And that ratification was to make them a kingdom of priests. Kingdom of priests which would go out into the world of Gentiles and lead the Gentiles back to God and lead the Gentiles through them in the praise and worship of God. But before they can do that, God has to deal with them because not all Jews were believing Jews. Uh, you know, people today say, well, the Jews are God's chosen people. And I say, yes and no. <laughs> In the dispensation of grace, God has temporarily set aside Israel and will once again deal with them after the rapture. Prior to that, uh, all Israel uh, is not saved Israel. Only those who are saved Jews. And as a matter of fact, we were talking during the break about uh, Hitler and the like. Why did the Jews go through the Holocaust? Why was there a World War II? Why was there a World War I? Why is there persecution in Russia? Uh, why do Jews have a difficult uh, time around the world? Because <coughs> Satan wants to annihilate the Jew. We well, find out he uh, can't uh, uh, do that. And so the kingdom of Antichrist with its mark of the beast is to bring Jews into the kingdom and get the mark so they can't be saved to be part of the future kingdom. So he amalgamates the, the Jews. What does he do to the remnant of believing Jews? He attempts to destroy them at that time. That's why the devil goes after them. He doesn't want a believing Jew to be on this earth. But see, that happens before the dispensation of grace and after the dispensation of grace. Any Jew that believes during this dispensation, you say, well, the Jews have a church. They go over to the synagogue. They've got their rabbis. And you say, well, be king. So what? The rabbi is unsaved and the Jews are unsaved because unless they believe in Jesus Christ, they're, they're going to go straight to hell. But if the Jew gets saved in this dispensation, what happens to him regarding the church? He is neither Jew nor Gentile. This is the age of, of a neutral uh, of a, uh, an ethnic neutral agency. But you go back under law and it's Jew all the way. And Gentiles only as they are related to Jews. Okay, get a little excited because probably most of Christianity has absolutely no clue that that's, that's the truth of God's word. Uh, chapter 19 of Exodus again. Now, we contended in the first hour that there is not one person in any denomination or religion that requires water today that doesn't the Bible lack. Not one. Oh, what would you say? Don't uh, none of this group baptize babies, take away original sin? Where is that in the scripture? Find it. Or did some man or some denomination make this up? Where is it that you, that you get water and, and put it on an infant's head and you make him a child of the covenant? Where is that in the scripture? Will you find that for me? Where is it in the scripture that you put a tank in the back of your church and dress somebody up in a baptismal robe and, and, and baptize them and the, and the guy gets in there up, up to his chest in water, uh, but he's got wading boots on and they've got this baptismal robe on. Where is that in scripture? Or did John the Baptist with his camel hair <laughs> suit on uh, did he wade in the water with them and they had the clothes they had on their back they took and they came right in that water and dipped the whole person washing clothes in the body simultaneously now let's baptize that way let's get people in their Sunday good to go to meet clothes put us a tank in the back and you go out dripping wet I'm telling you that that is wrong all right so where did they get this idea well Exodus 19 Exodus 19, verse number 10. Now, you'll remember these are verses right down from the preamble to law. I'll make you a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
Okay? How's this going to come about? Well, you've got to be ready when God comes. And that's what kingdom baptism is. The kingdom's coming. God's going to establish the kingdom. You've got to be ready. How do you get ready? Go to the people, verse 10, and sanctify them. Now, the word sanctification means to set them apart. They had been marching in the wilderness without a bath for days. <laughs> yeah. And even God could only tolerate so much of a whole nation. <laughs> And, uh, you know, they, they, didn't, uh, they didn't have their Tao or their zest, and they didn't have other uh, accompanying uh, perfume, shall we say. And so, set them apart. Ha have them be different from the people. How? Their clothes are clean, their bodies are clean, and both smell good now, because they're going to approach God. Show, you know, a little respect here. So how do you do that? Let them wash their clothes. Be ready against the third day, and the Lord will come down on the sight of all the people. Verse number 14. Moses went down from the mount and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. That is, they took a dip in, in the water uh, with their whole body. And be ready against uh, the third day. Now, we're going to take a look at some other verses here in just a little bit regarding this. But this is how Israel understood their, their future relation with God in the kingdom. That there would come a time when the, when the kingdom would come and that nationally they would have to be washed. I mean, the whole group of them, or at least those out of the group that wanted to be part of the kingdom. And that's, that's the situation that we have when John the Baptist arrived on the scene. We read it in the responsive reading. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came and John said, bunch of snakes. You're not going to be baptized. Come on, be baptized in me. They wouldn't associate with his baptism. They had their baptisms. They had their high priest. If anybody in Israel said, I refuse John, but I'll be saved by being baptized with the high priest at the temple, would they be saved? No, they would not. The salvation of God at that moment was vested in John the Baptist, and his baptism was kingdom baptism. It had nothing whatsoever to do with the temple or the high priest or the biblical priesthood, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and indeed only they could get saved if they were baptized of John. That's it. The salvation of God came down to one man, and that was John the Baptist. And it was him then that, uh, that started induction into the national priesthood of Israel, induction in the kingdom church with kingdom baptism. His first words as a, as a message, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. All right, uh, so let's, uh, let's take a look at Aaron, chapter 29 of Exodus. Before the Aaronic priesthood had its induction services, the nation of Israel had a prototype of its national priesthood and induction. They had to wash their clothes, which had to do with the clothes on their back, their bodies, they all did, and they were, they were up. All right? Exodus chapter 29. And starting with verse number four. Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt wash them with water. This, this, is, even, this is difficult. I'm glad when I was ordained, there was, there was nothing like this that had to be. Uh, yeah, because they had to, they had to undress uh, and, uh, and somebody else had to wash them. And that's more or less what the baptizers do. Moses had to wash Aaron. But was John the Baptist washing people as it were? Yes, he was. Uh, he was sanctioning their washing. He was sanctioning their baptism. Uh, he made sure that the requirement that God had for entrance into the kingdom church and or kingdom was met. And so he, in, in fact, washed them in that sense. But you have Moses literally washing Aaron. You'll take the garments and put them on Aaron. <clears throat> now, the difference here between the tribal priesthood of Aaron and the national priesthood of Israel with regard to clothes are these. There was no special clothing for the rank and file of Israel. What they had on their back 
was their priesthood clothes. Uh, but with Aaron's, they were special made because he was uh, the high priest and he would be, uh, especially for Israel. So he had special garments, but his body still had to be washed. And these special sanctified garments were put on him. But with the rank and file of Israel, let me tell you, the, probably the clothes that the people came from in Judea and Jerusalem and of the poor people there, how many suits of clothes do you suppose they had? How many did John have? One. I mean, he didn't, he didn't go back and say, oh, I didn't go through my wardrobe, but you know, I, I'll wear the black camel today and tomorrow I'll wear the brown and so forth. He wore one and he kept it clean by uh, these baptisms. His, his feet and his hands were probably like prunes out of the magic. I don't know. But um, anyway, then it says, verse 7, you'll take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and, and anoint him and bring his sons and put coats upon them. And you'll gird them with their, their girls, Aaron and his sons, put on their bonnets, the priest's office, uh, for a perpetual statute and in order to consecrate Aaron and his sons. Okay, so over here we have bodies washed, special clothes, and it consecrated them or inducted them into the priesthood, the servants of God. And they were anointed. Over here with kingdom baptism, when Jesus Christ came up out of the water, by the way, prior to that, who was not on him in an official sense? What happened when he came up out of water? Yeah, if he had not been baptized to John, the Holy Spirit would have never come on him. He had to be identified with the kingdom church, and, and, and otherwise the Holy Spirit would have never come on him. Uh, because that is the anointing of God for the kingdom church. Now, did Jesus Christ have special clothes when he came to be baptized? Did he put on this beautiful little robe and everything was uh, all neat, take his clothes off and lay them back there? Uh, did somebody give him a nice clean uh, uh, towel with uh, some uh, softener in it, make it smell real good? He did not. He came with the clothes on his back. He came into the Jordan River, which was running water. John the Baptist said, whoa, wait one second. Jesus said, it's a legal ordinance. If I don't do it, I'm going to be a sinner. Suffer it to be so. John said, all right, fine. Uh, we'll we'll dunk him under. Couldn't pull him under. He's the Messiah. He's got to, excuse me, that's just a little sidelight. You always think of these things when you're by yourself. And I get tickled and appreciate them on my own. And I think I'll share them. But it's one of those things, again, where you have to be there and, and you're not. But, yeah, just imagine. All right. Up comes Jesus Christ. Down comes the Holy Spirit. Aaron was washed. He had the, the, the clothes on. Down comes the anointing oil inducted into the priesthood. Here was a Jesus or the believing Jew at the time. He went into the water. He went all the way under with the clothes on his back. He came up and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, mind you, there was a prototype with Christ's baptism that didn't happen until three years later at Pentecost with the Holy Spirit. But it was, it was a, um, uh, a token, as it were, of, of the verification that what happened here with Jesus was going to happen with kingdom saints after the Lord's Supper was instituted, after the blood of the new covenant was shed. And so there, there's a connection, you see. <laughs> In order to participate in the Lord's Supper at that time in history, if they weren't linked, at that time in history, what did you have to be? Did you have to be water baptized? Okay, I, I can see. I can see now we're we're going to go go back. In order to participate in the Lord's Supper at that time, quit reading Paul. Forget Paul. Stop it. <laughs> Think Jew here. Could a Jew who did not uh, submit to John's baptism, Jesus' baptism, or that of the twelve, participate in the Lord's Supper? No, they could not. That's why when dispensationalists say the water baptism of the Lord's Supper were never linked, wait one second. Everybody who first participated uh, in it, except for, except for Judas Iscariot, and again, he was a scoundrel. Uh, he, was, he was lying all the way. Everybody had submitted to what baptism? 
Kingdom baptism. Now, were there a whole lot of Jews participating in the Passover on the day that the Lord's Supper was instituted? Yes, it was the Passover. That's why they were there. You know, there were millions of Jews in Jerusalem at that time to sacrifice the Passover, eat the Passover meal. But only those in the upper room did what? Also ate of the Lord's Supper, which is a New Testament uh, remembrance of the accomplishment of the, of the fulfillment of the New Covenant. Uh, the, the potential of having forget, total forgiveness of sins for all eternity. And so you could not participate now that they were at the temple, they washed their hands, they washed their little feet, they paid their prices, they had their sacrifices, they slipped the throne of the Passover lamb and they ate the Passover, and they went out of Jerusalem, all who did so, unsaved. Only those who submitted to kingdom baptism and Passover and the Lord's Supper were what? Saved. Because to qualify for the Lord's Supper, you had to be kingdom baptized. <coughs> um, and I, I can see now, I, I'm glad I brought this up, because I can see we're, we're still relating to the Lord's Supper over here in, in Paul's territory. It had nothing whatsoever to do with that. Um, all right, let's go to Leviticus 15. Let's, let's get you washed just a little bit more. I can hear you. Brainwashing is not allowed <laughs> Believe you me, this is not brainwashing. This is as accurate a uh, doctrine as uh, could be. Leviticus 15. Now, you can read through the whole chapter, will not, will not do so. But I want you to understand something about John's need for baptizing at the Jordan River. There's all kinds of needs there uh, by way of fulfillment and symbolism. He started his baptistic ministry where Joshua came over with the, that second generation of Jews, uh, where they crossed the Jordan into the land. And of course, that the, the symbol is with the kingdom is coming and it's going to start in the land and he's calling Jews home. And so they had to make the, the crossing as well. Uh, and uh, in the water and out of the water, from one side of the river to the other. Uh, so from, from um, being unsaved to salvation as in the kingdom. So there's symbolism there. But there were other reasons that John had to baptize in the Jordan and not in some stagnant uh, pool as we have in, in the, those churches. Because the need was for running water to be applied, uh, or a, a pool of fresh water. It couldn't be some swamp, you know, with, with a, a scum on it. Uh, you couldn't do that because you'd, you'd go down and come up and you'd still be what? Unclean. So, uh, verse number one, the Lord spake to Moses and Aaron, speak to the children of Israel and say, when any man has a running issue out of his flesh, uh, and this has to do, please excuse, uh, it, it, it has to do, number one, with, uh, with pus, or number two, with sperm, uh, some type of infection, or what have you. This shall be uncleanness in his issue. His flesh run with his issue, his flesh be stopped from it, it's uncleanness. Every bed where he lies, see this is where the idea of you have to get your clothes washed with the body, so it happens one of the same time. Every man where he lies uh, that has the issue is unclean. Everything wrong he sits shall be unclean. Whosoever touches his bed and, uh, shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and shall be unclean. He that sits on anything wherein he sat that has the issue shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and shall be uh, unclean. He that touches the flesh of him that has the issue shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and shall be um, unclean. And on and on it goes. Come down to verse number 13. And when he that had an issue is cleansed of the issue, he'll number his days to himself. For his cleansing, he shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh and know this, in running water and shall be clean. Now, here are all these Jews who, by the way, 
They didn't have faucets. They didn't have access to running water like, like we do. Uh, you know, they had to go and, and drag their water up out of well. They didn't have access to, to, uh, to daily bathing. And so when John called on them, they understood that they had to be dipped in running water. Here's the Jordan River. And so they dipped themselves. Why? Simply because they were unclean. Do you, do you suppose that there was much dirt on them? Yes. Do you suppose that, that there might have been infection? Yes. Do you suppose that bodily issues might be still on them? Uh, you know, they had sexual relations. That's what it's talking about. Issues. Uh, and so you had male sperm. If it was on the female or the male, they were still unclean. And their clothes were unclean, and their house was unclean, and you know, their saddles were unclean, and the horses were unclean, and all of this. So uh, in order to eliminate it all, you had to baptize everything. But John and Jesus and, and God himself made kingdom baptism easy. Come with the clothes on your back, go down, go up, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. That's salvation under the dispensational law. It's not for today. Uh, and if you try it today, you're not saved. Okay, let's go to Numbers 19. Numbers 19. In this um, particular section, and again, you can read uh, the, the whole thing, but in verse number two, it talks about the ordinance of the law. And this ordinance, it has to do with cleansing of the person to be fit for meeting God. Uh, and verse number seven, then the priest shall wash his clothes. He shall bathe his flesh in the water and afterwards come back into the camp. He that burns the red heifer shall wash his clothes in water, bathe his flesh in water, and shall be unclean unto even. And on and on it goes. It calls it, last part of verse 9, the water of separation as a purification from sin. So, and, and also note verse number 10, it's a statute forever. So, the nation of Israel is approaching the kingdom. There are believing Jews and unbelieving Jews. What separated these people or sanctified them? Kingdom baptism, how was it administered? By one God called man who said the kingdom is near, they came into running water, the Jordan River, he sanctioned their baptism up and down, they had their clothes and their flesh clean at one time, and they were added to the kingdom church. That is what's going on, and that's how we, uh, we need to understand it. So out of the many baptisms Israel had, there is one that becomes pronounced. One that is most important, and that eventually comes to be kingdom baptism. All right, let's, um, let's go to Matthew chapter 3 again. Matthew chapter 3. And the points that uh, we have been making is that Israel has a lot of baptisms. Eventually it comes down to the one baptism that is essential for entrance into the kingdom. This baptism was still a temporal old covenant ordinance, but it, it, it was part of the law and, uh, and was, uh, was necessary to, to be saved, especially when it uh, eventually was implemented. But that's the point that we're making. It was said that they would be a kingdom of priests in the preamble of the Magna Carta of the kingdom. The preamble to the law. I will make you, if ye will, a kingdom of priests. They had a prototype there. God's coming down to give you this kingdom information. In order to be sanctified or ready to meet him, you've got to be baptized. Body and clothes. Down and, down and up. All right? Uh, but now... Kingdom baptism, and that's what we're naming this, is it is water, kingdom baptism is water baptism, but we're just not making it any of Israel's baptism. It's the one that gave entrance into the kingdom. So we designate that kingdom baptism. 
Kingdom proximity necessitated kingdom baptism. Uh, let's look at it again. Verse number, uh, let's go to verse 2 in Matthew 3. John came in the wilderness of Judea. It's funny, uh, you know, he didn't go to Rome. Uh, he didn't go to any other city. He came to Jerusalem. Why? Because it's the city of the great king. And he came to Judea because that's the province where Jerusalem is located. And uh, Judea was uh, where it housed uh, Benjamin and Judah, the two tribes that were the last tribes to stay faithful to God before they were judged and dispersed. And so he comes back calling now these Jews in the land to the kingdom. <coughs> and it's no mistake, he didn't do it in Evansville. He didn't do it in Washington, D.C. Uh, he didn't do it, you know, in Seattle or L.A. He did it in Jerusalem because it, it would have been irrelevant in any other city and uh, district. Repent ye for the kingdom is at hand. Drop down to, to verse 5. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea. Notice the high priest didn't invite John to the temple. John was unwelcome there. Jews had their religion, but the religion did corrupted the truth of God. They had their church, they had their membership, they had their baptisms, they had their ministers, and all of them were corrupt to the core. And that's what we contend today. Those who do not preach the truth of God's word are the same as those in the temple there. They're, they're not telling the truth. The truth is, he had to go to Jerusalem and Judea, but he had to call people out of these, these places. Then he went out to him, Jerusalem and Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So, this is how a person got saved. Now, did Jesus Christ preach the same message? Yes, he did. Chapter 4. Verse 12. When Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Verse number 17. So from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, the very same words of John, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, come down to verse number 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness. So Jesus Christ took up the same gospel declaration as John the Baptist. John couldn't. He was in jail. Jesus Christ took it up and, uh, and even started, as we'll see in just a little bit, uh, with, with John's baptism. But before we do that, let's... Uh, Let's go to Mark chapter 1. Now, I'm going to again clarify uh, some things so that we're all on uh, the same page and the same dispensation uh, and so forth. Do we believe in baptismal regeneration in the dispensation of grace? No. Do we believe in baptismal regeneration in the dispensation of law? Yes. Okay. But do we believe that any Jew who was, who was baptized by anybody was saved? No. It had to be administered by the ones God called with the kingdom message, starting with John the Baptist. So, uh, chapter 1 of Mark, verse number 1. Hey, by the way, thank you, I like that. It was a positive response, everybody shook their heads. Or, or you waited until I did. I don't know. <laughs> Just get you awake. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As it is written, verse 2, Behold, I send my prophet before thy face to prepare the way. John, and this is a reference to John the Baptist, is the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Make his path straight to where? The kingdom. That's what it's talking about. John was a kingdom preacher. 
The kingdom's at, at hand. And he's preparing a people for the Lord to get on this road or path into the kingdom. It's the narrow road to be sure. The other Jews who disbelieved Jesus and John and the twelve were on the broad road, but the narrow road started with kingdom baptism. Now, how do we know that? How did John prepare the way of the Lord to make his path straight? Verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. If this is not a baptismal regeneration as verse, I do not know what is, but it has nothing to do with us because our salvation is totally apart from water altogether. But once kingdom baptism was instituted, that's how their sins were remitted. Now in this particular study, we're going to link something, remember? We we're talking about where water baptism and the Lord's Supper linked. Now, uh, prior to the cross and then after the cross, prior to the cross, two things were implemented. Kingdom baptism for the what? Remission of sins. And Jesus Christ, <laughs> yes, for Jews. <laughs> no, that, no, that's a good thing. You're right on the, that's, that's the, it's the page after the one we're on. <laughs> but you're right. It was, it was the baptism, but I'm going to link two phrases here. And we're going to unite in the linking of these two phrases. The water, the kingdom baptism and the Lord's Supper. Kingdom baptism gave you the remission of what? Sins. That's how you were saved. Okay? But now up to this point, remember, that's how a person was saved because that's all they knew. Jesus Christ gave something regarding uh, um, an addition to the information they had. Remember, all the way up those, those hundreds of years to John the Baptist, kingdom baptism was not an issue until he arrived. Did it then become an issue of salvation? Yes. Without it, you didn't get remission of sins. Three years after the implement... Im <laughs> we're going to talk about a show cartoon with Pork and Pig again. <laughs> Talking. Three years after that was started, on the night before he died on the cross, he gave the Lord's Supper and he said, This is my body and this is my blood shed for what? Well, I thought water baptism gave you the remission of sin. Well, hang on. We're both required. We're both linked. After he ascended and gave the Great Commission, was water baptism and the Lord's Supper still required? After he ascended and gave the Great Commission, could only those who were baptized by God's authorized kingdom preachers uh, protect in the Lord's Supper? Right. Are the, is it linked or not? Yes. The difference being is that water baptism was an outward cleansing uh, regarding entrance into the kingdom, but it showed that you had repented. Now God added, and this is where we have progressive revelation. Usually when we think, and we'll deal with this a little more, but probably next week I'll give your brain an opportunity to, <laughs> to assemble some of this stuff. <laughs> but stay with me here. And now I forgot where I was. Where, where are we talking about? Uh, the Lord's Supper. Okay. Pro progressive, re progressive revelation. All right. Here is where the mystery started with Paul. Okay. Did anybody prior to that know about the mystery? Once it was revealed, do we now know about it? Yes. That's called progressive revelation where God adds to more information in his dealings with men. We now know it. It's inexcusable to be ignorant of the mystery because God has given it and we should understand it. But now that's, that's historic progressive revelation where God gives new things. And, and each just with each just <laughs> I am struggling here with each dispensation. God gave a new revelation. Now, what is not understood is that sometimes 
God gave progressively revelation within a dispensation. When we started with Exodus 19, 5 and 6, did they have a certain amount of information there? But did, did they know, for example, that they were going to have to be baptized and wash their clothes before God gave the law on Mount Sinai? No. Gave information, if ye will. Gave that much. Then they said, well, what do we have to do? God gave a little more. He said, oh, you're going to have to wash your clothes. Did they know about the Ten Commandments at this time in history? No, they didn't come till chapter 20. We're still in chapter 19. God added a little bit more, the law. Uh, by the time we get to Deuteronomy, we have 40 years that have transpired of Israel's history. And God added that information. Then we have Joshua uh, and so forth until God adds and adds and adds and adds and here comes John the Baptist. What did God do with kingdom baptism? He added it. It's now a requirement for salvation. Now here comes Jesus Christ and he adds the Lord's Supper. This is all part of Israel's salvation package. It's an addition and addition and addition and addition. But each time he added information, men were still required to obey it. So that if they said, well, I'm, I'm not going to believe John's message. I just believe Moses' message. Would they be saved? No. Because the updated revelation of God was now vested in John. This is what God is requiring for your salvation. When Jesus Christ said, this is the uh, blood of the New Testament. This do ye in remembrance of me. It's shed for the remission of sin. Were they required to observe that under law? Now, we're just about out of time. Let's, we're right here in Mark. Let's back up to Matthew 28. <coughs> who said, who said as often as you do this? Paul said. We're reading back. Uh, that's true, and that's what the Bible says about as often as you do it. But with, with the Jews, it was, it was different. When, when did the Jews have to keep the Lord's Supper? When was it implemented? Passover. You could not have a, a believing Jew could, yes, he, it was an ordinance, the Passover was an ordinance. They had to keep the Passover. But for a kingdom uh, church member, what other thing did they have to do? They had to have the Lord's Supper uh, at, at that particular time. It became linked and it became an ordinance. It became part of their of their salvation package. Okay, well let's we're uh, let's um let's look at something real quick here while we've got uh, this um. Uh, Let's go to, to Luke 22. And then I'll then hold your place here in Matthew. Luke 22. Hold your place in Matthew. And then we'll, we'll bring this to a screeching halt. Alright. Now this takes us to the Lord's Supper as it was instituted under law. Now, it says, verse number uh, 15, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I will not eat any more thereof until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. The Passover is an eternal ordinance, will always be observed by the Jews. 